Well, I want to welcome everybody who's here in person today, also those of us who's joining us online on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we're going to start off with a little competition today. Take a look. We're going to find out who is our Savior's biggest sinner. <laughs> Meaning that of everybody here today, this person is the biggest sinner in the room. Like seriously, how many of you came, were driving to church this morning thinking, man, I really hope we play this game today. <laughs> we are going to have a lot of fun with this. Who is our Savior's biggest sinner? Does anybody just want to claim the prize outright? Like you want to claim the title? I got a trophy for you. You were the first one up. No, I'm kidding. The only way to give this out really is to have a, a, a fair assessment that sort of looks at specifically uh, what our values are in terms of just how sinful we are. And so here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to read us 10 questions, and these 10 questions are going to talk about sins that you and I commit. And the hope is that by the end of these 10 questions, there will be one person standing who is the most sinful person in the room. Meaning that this person will have raised their hand all 10 questions, all right? Now, I realize that for about half of you in the room today, your heart rate just went up by about 20 beats per minute. In fact, my heart rate also went up 20 beats per minute. For the other half of you, man, this is nothing. You're like, let's go, bring it on. I am a poor and miserable sinner. Well, friends, for the half of you who are kind of squirming in your seats, uh, I want to just bring down your heart rate just a little bit here. This is going to be challenged by choice, meaning that you do not have to participate, but if you do, remember, you could win the coveted title of our Savior's biggest sinner. I mean, seriously, I cannot think of a greater honor than that. In fact, take a look at this. Here at Our Savior, we have a bunch of different acronyms. For example, OS stands for Our Savior. OSLC stands for Our Savior Lutheran Church. OSLS stands for Our Savior Lutheran School, and today, for the very first time, we are going to add an acronym to that list, the OSBS, Our Savior's Biggest Sinner. I mean, can you imagine walking in next Sunday and everybody's like, hey, OSBS, how are you? It's so great to see you. All right, well, let's start out with this assessment here. Remember, this is challenge by choice. You do not have to participate, but I really want to encourage you to... Because remember, you could win this title. Now, as we go through these 10 questions, I want you to keep track mentally of how many questions you raise your hand for. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Here's the first one. Raise your hand if you've ever lied to your parents or other family members when you were a kid. It's an easy one. Some of you are lying now. All right, here's the next one. Raise your hand if you've ever gossiped about somebody. Like, hey, remember when the pastor that one time didn't wear a plaid shirt? What was that about, right? <laughs> All right, how about the next one? Raise your hand if you've ever been envious of somebody. You've wanted what they have. Very good. All right, raise your hand. Here's the next one. If you've ever gone over the speed limit. Here's a bonus question. Raise your hand if you went over the speed limit on the way to church this morning. I appreciate your honesty. That was like the whole front row. It was great. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Raise your hand if you've ever said something to somebody, or, oh, sorry, raise your hand if you've ever thought or said a curse word. Ooh. We won't ask what curse word. Here's the next one. Raise your hand if you've ever said something to somebody out of anger. Some of you are laughing like, that's every day for me. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever cut a corner while working a job or doing a chore. Don't tell my wife this. One time she asked me to, to mop the floors in the bathroom. I took a Lysol wipe and I just wiped it down. <laughs> hey, honey. <laughs> we'll talk after the service, yeah. Please pray for me. All right, here's the next one. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever purposely ignored somebody in response to something they said or did to you. Like you gave them the cold shoulder. Ooh, yeah. All right, how about this one? Raise your hand if you've ever talked back to your parents or other family members. If there are kids in this room, parents, go ahead and just hold up their hand if they're not doing it. There we go. All right, and the last one here, take a look. Raise your hand if you've ever told a white lie about somebody else's performance or appearance. Like, oh, wow, I love your haircut. It looks great. We just love your plaid shirts. We just love your plaid shirts. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to have to go home and think about that one now. 
All right, so those are the 10 questions. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and add them up in your mind, how many you raised your hand for, and here's what we're gonna do in just a minute. We're gonna find out which one of you is our Savior's biggest sinner. Are you ready for this? All right, if you raise your hand, if you raised your hand for uh, five or more of these questions, how many of you raise your hand for five or more of these questions? All right, very good. How about six or more of these questions? All right, seven or more of these questions? Eight or more? I'm still in this too. Nine or more? How many of you raise your hand for all 10 questions? Whoa, I did not order that many trophies. <laughs> wow, seriously, I thought this was like gonna be something where you'd ask the 10 questions and we get down to one person, but it looks like a lot of you are still in the running. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, we could go on to maybe a round two or a round three, but I have a feeling that we're gonna be here all day because man, we are quite a sinful bunch of people, aren't we? Now, friends, here's the reality with this. Uh, when you think about this, uh, let's think about what we do as a culture. Now, I know for some of you here today, you're probably relieved that we've put a pause on this, but I want you to think about this for a moment. If we continued this whole competition out to round 3,296, where exactly do you think you would rank in terms of your sin compared to everybody in this room? For example, would you land in the top 100? Would you maybe be in the top 50? Dare I say, would you crack the top 10? Or would you be the OSBS? <laughs> you see, friends, here's the idea this morning. Take a look that as a culture, our view of other people is largely based on the sins that they commit. In other words, the opinions that we view, the opinions we form of other people, it's based on the sins that they commit. And friends, here's the thing. We start to do this, we're socialized, at a very young age to view people in this way. For example, let's say you're in kindergarten and there's a boy in your class named Johnny and he's constantly acting up and not doing what he's supposed to be doing and your parents ask you about Johnny, what do you say? You say, oh, Johnny is bad, right? Now at the same time, there's another girl in your class, her name is Sally, and man, Sally, she's very quiet and does everything that she's supposed to do. When your parents ask you about Sally, what do you say? You say, oh, Sally is good. And friends, as we get older, we continue to live in this culture where our view of other people is largely based on the sins that they commit. Now, you and I, we tend to do this in two main ways. Here's the first one. Take a look. The first thing that shapes our view of other people is the nature of their sins. For example, let's say you turn on the local news and you're watching this news story about this guy that robbed a jewelry store and then he, he stole a car and he crashed it into a ditch and then they show the helicopter cam of him running through the neighborhood and the police officers are chasing after him and finally they catch him as he's going over a fence into the backyard of somebody's home and all of a sudden they, they, they throw the mugshot up on the screen and lo and behold, who is it? It's Johnny from kindergarten. <laughs> now, of course, Johnny's an adult at this point, but now that you see this mugshot and hear what he did, all of a sudden it's no longer just Johnny is bad from kindergarten, now Johnny is what? He's really bad. Why? Well, because of the nature of his sins. He, robbed a jewelry store, he stole a car, and he got caught by police. Now, the other thing, take a look, the second thing that shapes our view of other people is the frequency of their sin. In other words, the more somebody sins, the more sinful you find them to be. For example, let's say you're watching the same newscast, you're like, wow, Johnny, he's, he's been arrested, and then the newscaster says, this is Johnny's 14th arrest in the past three months. And friends, all of a sudden, now it's not just that Johnny is really bad, now Johnny is what? He's really, really bad, right? Why? Because of the frequency of his sins. He's been arrested 14 times in the past three months. Now, here's what happens. Over time, we take a look at the, the, the nature of people's sins. We take a look at the frequency of their sins. And, and subconsciously, sometimes we don't even realize it, we start to rank them in terms of our mental lists of sinners. In other words, the Johnnies are up here. They're the really bad people, the sinful people. And all the way down to the Sallies down here, they're the good people. And everybody else is somewhere in between. Now, Here's the question, where are you in that ranking? If you take all the people in the world, the most sinful people down to the least sinful people, where would you place yourself in that ranking? You see, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how sinful I think you are. It also doesn't matter how sinful you think you are. It doesn't matter how sinful the person sitting next to you think you are. The only thing that matters is how sinful God thinks you are, right? And so friends, this morning as we finish up our series called out, here's the question that we're going to try and answer today. Take a look. Where do you rank 
on God's list of sinners. In other words, if God was to take all the people who ever existed and all the people who will ever exist, and he ranked them from 1 to 15 billion, where exactly would he rank you? You know, this is the question that the religious leaders were trying to figure out back in Jesus' time. In fact, if you have a Bible with you this morning or access to the Bible on your phone, I want to encourage you to open up with me to John chapter 8, because in John chapter 8, Jesus, he gives us the definitive answer to this question. Now, to help us set us the stage for what we're about to read, at this point in Jesus' ministry, John chapter 8, he is very well known. Like, he's healed people He's performed miracles. He's done all these sorts of things. He is a household name. Like if you came across somebody and they're like, Jesus who? You would assume that they had been living under a rock. That's how popular Jesus had become. And friends, one of the things that Jesus would do on a regular basis is, especially on the Sabbath, he would go into the synagogue or he would go into the temple and he would sit down and he would teach anybody who wanted to learn from him. It was like BSF on steroids. And on top of that, you can imagine the first time he did it, There are probably a few people there. He's sitting, teaching some things. But by the time we get to John chapter 8, Jesus is so well-known. He is the most well-attended Bible study in the entire region. People just want to come and learn from him. And so, friends, take a look at this this morning. One day, Jesus, he walks into the synagogue, into the temple, and take a look at what happens. It says, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, friends, let me ask you this morning, have you ever been at a social gathering before and you're standing around with a couple people and you're telling them a story about something that happened that week or maybe something in the past? Maybe you have one of your go-to stories and you're telling them the things. Right when you get to the good part, all of a sudden this random person comes up, they see somebody you're talking to and they say, hey, Jerry, how's it going? And they come on over and everybody stops listening to you. They turn to that person And they greet them, and then all of a sudden, you're standing there frozen. You're like, wait a second. I'm not done with my story. And then you get this sinking suspicion. You're like, oh, no, I'm actually done with my story now because they're not going to listen. They've moved on to another conversation. That is can be very frustrating. I mean, teachers, especially if you're in this room, you know that sometimes there's nothing worse than being interrupted in the middle of a lesson plan. Now, imagine that this was Jesus here. He's, He's sitting down. He's teaching. And all of a sudden, the doors burst open. And these religious leaders and Pharisees, they come marching in and totally interrupt his teaching. And friends, according to verse 3, who is with them? It's a woman caught in adultery. Now, take a look at what happens next here. It says, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law. Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis For accusing him. Now, just by a show of hands this morning, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, uh, rules for thee, but not for me? Rules for thee, but not for me. If you've never heard that before, the whole idea behind this is that sometimes you and I, we use rules to hold people accountable for something they do, but then when we do the exact same thing, we pretend as though those rules don't even exist. Rules for thee, but not for me. For example, let's say you're driving down the road one day, And you see a driver that's speeding, that's going really fast, and all of a sudden you're like, man, I wish somebody would pull that guy over. And lo and behold, God answered your prayers, right? A police officer turned on the lights, grabs that person, pulls over to the side. You're sitting in your car driving along. What are you doing? Now you turn into like a cheerleader. You're like, yeah, get him. Give him that ticket. Give him the biggest ticket he wants. That guy was going way too fast. But then a few months later, you're speeding down that exact same road, And all of a sudden, the lights start flashing, and you get pulled over. And what are you doing? As the officer gets out of the car, you're trying to figure out what you need to say to make sure that you get a warning and not a ticket. And so you roll down the window, and the officer's like, "Um, excuse me, did you know you were going 52 and a 35? You're like, oh, officer, I'm so glad you brought that up. (laughs) You know, I just bought this new pair of shoes, and I'm wearing them today for the first time, and I realized they're a lot heavier than my previous shoes. And I think they've been pressing down on that gas pedal more than usual. In fact, I have my spare, my old shoes in the back seat. I could put them back on and I can show you. I mean, man, I will definitely go 35 with those shoes on. Officer, thank you so much for the warning, right? You see, friends, a couple months ago, you were totally fine having this other driver get a ticket. 
But now that you're in the hot seat, well, you don't want a ticket at all. Rules for thee, but not for me. Now, friends, perhaps the most frustrating part about this whole situation, the religious leaders, as we talked about in week one, they were guilty of breaking all sorts of rules, and yet they didn't want to be held accountable for breaking those rules. Instead, what do they want to do? They want to shift the burden off of them and point to people like this woman caught in adultery and hold her accountable for what she had done. In other words, they wanted to give off this image that they were the the Sallys, they were the good people. And this woman right here, she's the Johnny, she's the, the bad person. And friends, the fact that they took this woman into the synagogue in front of all these people and publicly humiliated her, they were trying to make her the TBS, the town's biggest sinner. Now, take a look at how Jesus responded to their question of whether or not they should stone her. It said, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his what? With his finger. You know, friends, there are a lot of mysteries in the Bible. This perhaps is one of the biggest ones because what did Jesus write in the sand? The reality is we don't know because John didn't record it. He's the only one who records the story, and he didn't write what Jesus wrote down. And so over the centuries, Bible scholars, they've tried to figure out, hey, what could possibly have Jesus written here? And for example, take a look. Some of them think that Jesus wrote a part of his Sermon on the Mount, like maybe do not judge or you too will be judged. Or take a look at this. Some people believe that he maybe just wrote a word like forgiven or grace or love. Or take a look at this one. Some people believe that he wrote down the names of all the religious leaders who were accusing this woman because if they were going to stone her, they were going to have to know specifically who are all these people that can stone her. Or friends, take a look. Some people believe that Jesus just wrote something random that had nothing to do with the situation at all, that he was just ignoring them while they were getting all flustered. Colin, can you keep this slide up all day? This would be great. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. Regardless of what Jesus wrote in the sand, the Pharisees were frustrated with him at this point because they kept asking him this question. You'll see in just a moment. Hey, Jesus, what should we do? Are we allowed to stone him or not? I mean, imagine this. You go to the beach with your family member or a friend, and you go up to them and you say, hey, where's the sunscreen? And they look at you, and instead of saying anything, they bend down and they start drawing a picture in the sand. And you're like, hey, um, excuse me, uh, where's, where's the sunscreen, right? You can imagine that this was the frustration that the religious leaders were feeling. Finally, Jesus gives them the answer that maybe they weren't looking for. Take a look at this in verse 7. It said, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, friends, this morning when you came in, you received a stone. I want you to go ahead and pull out that stone if you can for me. You know, back in the day, in terms of receiving the death penalty, today for us, we think of like the electric chair or lethal injection. But back in the day, the way that people received the death penalty was by stoning. For example, if somebody was caught in adultery, the people who caught that person, they would drag that person out into the middle of the town square, and everybody would gather around. I mean, this was a big to-do, a big event, and the people who caught that person, they would be the first one to throw stones. And then after that, everybody else, the whole town, they'd just just go right on in. They'd start stoning this person and throwing stones until this person eventually died from their injuries. Usually took just a couple minutes. And once this person was dead, They would take the body, they'd drag the body out into a field, and they'd bury the body. Friends, this is what the religious leaders wanted to do to this woman. They wanted to take her right outside the temple and throw stones at her until she died. Now, friends, I want you to imagine for a moment that all of us here today, we are the religious leaders who have come into the temple, and we've brought in this woman caught in adultery. I want you to imagine that she's standing right here, And you and I, we are ready to stone her. In fact, I want you to go ahead and just put your hand up like this, like you're ready to stone her. Now, friends, as you're getting ready to do this, notice what Jesus says there. He says, let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Friends, in just a minute here on the count of three, I want you to do one of two things. If you are here this morning and you are without sin, meaning you have never sinned in your life, I want you to throw that stone right here as hard as you can. Not at me, right here. (laughs) on the other hand if you are here this morning and you are with sin meaning that you have have sinned throughout your life 
On the count of three, I want you to drop this stone to the ground. Ready? One, two, three. Friends, can you imagine the sound that day that the people might have heard? You see, this morning, we set out to answer a specific question. Take a look. Where do, we, where do you rank on God's list of sinners? And as Jesus demonstrates right at this point in John chapter 8, take a look. The answer is you rank right alongside everybody else. You, me, the woman caught in adultery, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Johnnies, the Sallies, everybody in the world, all of us, have the exact same ranking. You remember what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3? Take a look. He said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, in God's eyes, God doesn't rank us based on the nature of our sin or the frequency of our sins. In God's eyes, you either are a sinner or you're not. And friends, therefore, as Jesus shows us in John chapter 8, every single one of us, we have the exact same ranking. And so friends, you know who this morning is our Savior's biggest sinner? It's you. And it's me. And it's the person sitting next to you, and it's the person behind you, it's the person in front of you, every single one of us, we are our Savior's biggest sinner. Why? Because all of us have sinned, and therefore all of us fall short of the glory of God. You see, you can imagine that day in John chapter 8, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're walking in thinking, man, we are better than this woman. And the woman's coming in and she's thinking, man, I'm worse than these religious leaders. And yet by saying what he said, Jesus evened the playing field. That it's not about who's ranked where, we're all ranked the same. You see, friends, the message that Jesus is sharing with all of us today is that because all of us are sinners, all of us, all of us need a savior. Take a look at how this story ends beginning in verse 9. It says that this those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Friends, think back earlier when Jesus said, let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Was there anybody in that room that day that met that criteria? There was one. It was Jesus. He was the only one without sin. Think about it. He was the only one who could have stoned her to death. And yet he didn't. Why? Well, friends, as Jesus says there, the reason why Jesus came into the world, it wasn't to condemn us of our sin. It was to save us from our sin. Friends, that's the good news that you and I get to carry around with us every single day, that though we are sinners, we take heart because in Jesus Christ, we have a Savior. Amen? And you know what? Here's my encouragement for you this, today. I, I want you to go ahead and pick up your rock. Hopefully, you wrote your name on it before you dropped it. No, I'm kidding. Whether you pick up somebody else's rock or your rock, go ahead and pick it up. And once you got your rock, here's, what I, here's my encouragement for you today. As you leave here today, take this stone with you. And in fact, what I want to encourage you throughout this upcoming week, maybe you, you carry it around in your pocket, or maybe you put it somewhere in your home or somewhere in your office that you will see it on a regular basis. I want to encourage you to put it somewhere where you will constantly experience it throughout this upcoming week. And here's the encouragement. Whenever you come across this rock in your pocket, or whenever you see it in your home or in your office, I want you to remind yourself of these two things. Number one, remind yourself that just because you have the power to condemn somebody for their sin doesn't mean that you actually have to condemn them. Friends, Jesus had every right to stone this woman to death, and yet he didn't. He showed her grace. And friends, that's the reality that you and I have every single day. When we think about this stone, we do not have to condemn the person that's standing in front of us. It's our right to do it, we can, but we don't have to. And then finally, number two, take a look. When you look at your stone or whenever you pick it up, remind yourself of these truths, that you are no better than anybody else, 
You are no worse than anybody else. Instead, you are just like everybody else because we are all sinners in need of a Savior. You see, friends, that day Jesus showed his ultimate ranking of where we all stand. Maybe in our culture today, we look at other people, we watch the Jerry Springer show, and we think, man, that person is a worse sinner than me. Or we come to church and we sit next to somebody and you're like, man, this person is such a less sinner than me, right? But that's not how Jesus sees us. He sees us all as sinners. And that's why when we say Jesus died for all, we mean it. Because he did. You see, friends, 2,000 years ago, this stone was used as a weapon. And my prayer for you and I today is that we will use it instead as an instrument of God's grace to the people in our life each and every day. That's the decision we have. We can either throw the stone or we can withhold it. We can stand up high or we can stand down low or we can look face to face and look at the person and say, this person is a sinner just like me. And both of us, we need forgiveness and grace in our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our decision. I wanna encourage you to carry this rock with you this week or have it in your home somewhere you remember that in Jesus Christ, We are all the O-S-V-S. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we give thanks today in the season of Lent that we get some time to reflect upon our own human nature, that as much as we may want to pretend or try and act like we are better than we are, we're not. We're all sinners. And Lord, we are reminded today some of us need to be humbled. We're like the religious leaders. We look down on other people and see them as bigger sinners than us. Some of us are here today and we're hurting. We're we're steeped in sin and we're frustrated. We look at other people and we say, man, I am so low. And yet you remind us today in your scripture that there is no distinction, that every single one of us us is a sinner. All of us are in need of a savior. And Lord Jesus, we give thanks that 2,000 years ago you died on a cross to be able to provide us with that salvation. And Lord, today, knowing that you didn't stone us, We now have the opportunity, metaphorically, to go out into the world and decide whether we're going to do the same to other people. Lord, as you showed us in John chapter 8 today, we don't have to condemn people for their sin. We can help them, just like you did, share truth, go and leave your life of sin. We can come alongside people and help them if they're struggling with sin, but we don't have to condemn them. Lord, help us to remember, help us to, to stay humble When we look at people who fall, we think about celebrities, politicians, all these people in the media, when they fall, let us not do so with glee, to say, ha, this person, they've fallen from their high pedestal. Instead, let's pray for them. Lord, when we open up the newspaper or we scroll through the the, the websites or whatever it is that we're doing and we read these stories of people who are steeped in sin, let us pray for them. Let us remember that they are sinners just like us. Lord, help us as we carry around these stones or we we keep them in our home or our office to remind ourselves of these truths every single day. Lord, we are so grateful for your mercy and your grace. We lift up these prayers to you today by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, you know, this year is kind of a weird year in the sense that Easter comes early. It comes before April. And uh, next Sunday is going to start Holy Week. So whether you're joining us online or here in person, we hope you'll join us. Palm Sunday next Sunday. And then throughout the week, we'll have Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Those are both at 6.30. And then on Easter Sunday, same time, 8 and 10 and 10 a.m. online. If you'd like to give to the Our Savior Ministry today, we have a a bowl that you can drop your offering in on the way out. You can also give online at OurSaviorFL.org. You can also text to give, and we are also on Venmo. Hopefully you got your rock today. You'll be reminded of some of these truths that Jesus teaches us today. Let's go ahead and stand as we continue our worship together this morning.